Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the second event of our Southwest Florida Climate Compass Speaker Series. I wanna thank each and every one of you for choosing to set aside time this afternoon to explore the topic of climate change from a diverse and unique perspective with us. Today, I am truly honored to have with us Admiral John White, who will present the nexus of our climate, oceans and security challenges and opportunities. Next slide. I'm Dr. Anna Pushkin Shevlin, Regional Director of Growing Climate Solutions Path to Positive. And I have with me co-hosting this, my colleague, Jennifer Roberts, Director of Path to Positive Communities at Eco America. Just a bit of housekeeping about today's presentation. We, want, we will be um, recording this presentation. So if you know anyone who has missed it or is unable to attend today, this is their opportunity to catch up with us later and watch the video. Secondly, this presentation will run about an hour and 15 minutes if we have good questions and answers. The Rear Admiral will speak for about 40 minutes, but he'll pause in between to answer some questions and then we'll be followed with a Q&A at the end. So please use the chat function for that as we will all be monitoring the chat. Next slide. A bit about Growing Climate Solutions for those of you who are with us for the first time. Growing Climate Solutions is a network of diverse Southwest Florida institutions, companies, civic organizations, religious groups, and stakeholders that together have committed to five principles, building climate awareness, protecting our natural assets, as we know that these are strategies to provide resilience, engaging and empowering our community leaders at every level to be inspired to guide good decision-making that will create a resilient future, ensuring that that future in Southwest Florida is prosperous and healthy for everyone in the community, which includes being inclusive in our decision-making and making sure that the outcomes are equitable. And finally, we are really happy to be able to promote and make visible good climate actions by our partners and others, as this is a way for us as a region to become a role model in the nation. Next slide. Jennifer, Eco America. Sure. Um, Jennifer Roberts with Eco America. We are pleased to partner with Growing Climate Solutions uh, for today's webinar. Our mission is a national mission to build public support and political resolve for climate solutions. And we look to do that in our local communities around the country, um, committed the, the whole time to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we work with cities and counties and states all over the United States. And we're really pleased to be a partner in today's presentation. You're gonna really enjoy it. So thank you. Next slide. No, not next slide. Um, so Growing Climate Solutions Path to Positive is made possible by four founding partners in our region and our collaboration with Eco America. They include the Community Foundation of Collier County, the Community Foundation of Southwest Florida, FGCU, our university partner, and the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. We also receive generous financial support from the Kapnick Family Foundation. So we want to thank all of our partners. Next slide. And most importantly, we want to thank our media sponsors. This program was supported in terms of media by Naples Daily News and the News Press and WGCU, our local NPR um, affiliate. And next, I would like to introduce Dr. Gregory Tully, Executive Director of FGCU's Water School, who will be introducing our speaker today. Next slide. Thank you, Anna. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, jo Admiral Jonathan White, United States Navy. Admiral White is the President and CEO of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, a nonprofit, a group of 90 organizations that includes nonprofits, academia and industry that advances ocean science and technology through discovery, understanding and action. He's also a member of the Advisory Council for the Nonpartisan Center for Climate and Security. Before retiring uh, from the Navy at the rank of Rear Admiral, he had a distinguished 32 year career in the Navy during which he had numerous assignments at sea and ashore. 
This culminated in his appointment as oceanographer and navigator of the Navy from 2012 to 2015. In this role, he assumed the helm of the Navy's task force on climate change. White's passion for the ocean and science began at a very early age as he grew up along Florida's Gulf Coast in Panama City. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Oceanographic Technology from the Florida Institute of Technology, and he holds a master's degree in meteorology and oceanography from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. Would you please join me in giving a warm Southwest Florida welcome to Admiral Jonathan White. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Thank you, Anna. Thanks to you, all of you, the people that support this wonderful effort. It's great to see all of you. And Jennifer, thank you for also being part of this. And I think you're going to be doing some of the moderating throughout uh, between you and Anna. So uh, I'll start my slides in a minute. I just wanted to say it's great to be back in South Florida. Well, and stuff, I'm not really there. I'm sitting here in 55 degree rainy cold DC. I live in Arlington, Virginia actually, but would love to be down there in, in person and look forward to doing so in the coming months. Uh, as a Florida native, I certainly consider that my home. The area where all of you are is one of my favorites uh, for the reasons that you're all there. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna get started here and share my screen and let's hope this uh, works out like it's supposed to and boom and hopefully give me a thumbs up Anna Jennifer can you see my first slide all right many thumbs up okay so we're going to talk about this as mentioned I'm going to go through both challenges and opportunities I really like the path to positive moniker of the growing climate solutions because there's so much gloom and doom. I like to look at things. We have great opportunities. So I'm gonna highlight those as well, but I'm gonna spend about the first half sort of looking at the negative, you know, the, a lot of the challenges, how they relate to issues of national security and concern. I got a presentation. I got a lot of pictures and slides. We're gonna walk through this pretty quickly. So it's gonna be dynamic. So put your seatbelts on. Uh, again, I'd love to be there in person and walk around uh, and ask you questions, but maybe next time. Okay, so let's get started here. Uh, so anyway, that's what my organization is. As Greg already said, it's a nonprofit organization, been around for decades. Uh, we work with federal agencies and all of the members of our consortium, including several institutions in Florida, from University of South Florida, Miami, University of Florida, dot, dot, dot. A lot of, any, a lot of the ones are involved in a lot, you know, a lot of very intensive ocean research. Um, and then this is basically if you look at a vision for the future, this organization was started by Admiral James Watkins, former chief of naval operations, a four star admiral uh, back in the mid 90s. And this was his vision as he worked through Congress on the, U on the, the U U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy around the turn of the century, started under Clinton, reported out under Bush. This is what he said is the ocean that we want. There was a lot of ocean concern back then, but climate change was just starting to factor into that. The climate change was a big part of it because we know that the health of the ocean and the health of our climate are totally integrated. And so I'll talk to that a little bit. So that's my organization. So I ask right now, where are we in terms of climate change, in terms of sea level rise, ocean things? And, you know, this is what you hear a lot in D.C. OK, we're on the brink of everything just falling apart and diving into the ocean. And, you know, what are we going to do? And, you know, it's an area of concern. It's an area of great concern, but I don't like to think it's all doom and gloom again, as I pointed out up front. So uh, taking a look at going from that visual of what worst case scenario could look like mm, a few years down the road, many years down the road. What I do want to point out is that basically we look at and the balance is our security and our prosperity as a planet, as a human race and all of the life on the planet. We have both challenges with growing population, growing, you know, from seven or eight billion to 10 billion by the turn of the century. Where are those people going to live? Where do they get food, water? How is the climate going to impact them? And we know that we're basically weighing down our planet in terms of sustainability. Many things that are out there, we see it all the time. But really, you know, we have a chance, opportunities to reduce the risk and drive up our sustainability. And I believe it comes from the investments and the right things in knowledge through scientific research, education, and the brilliant ideas and inventions that we have going on right now. So 
With that, let's go ahead and take a look at some of these challenges or take a look at that. So first of all, I just want to start off by saying, OK, what are some of the facts that are out there? Now, I know there's still a lot of skepticism with climate change. I meet with Congress people and senators all the time. It's many of them, you know, from various parts of the nation with, uh, you know, a lot of red state folks. And that's great. I met with Senator Rubio. I met uh, with Governor Scott in the past and those type of things. And you'll hear a lot of them say, yeah, we know climate change is going on, but we, what's causing it? How fast is it going to happen? There's still a lot of skepticism. What I want to point out here is that this is measurements of temperature. You can see that really starting in the mid 60s to about 1970, we started having space observations. These are extremely accurate. We've seen the planet warming in terms of atmospheric. And then we go say, well, what else is happening? We see measured in Hawaii for a long time now, you know, what is the, what is the overall concentration of carbon dioxide, the major greenhouse gas? We've seen that. This again, this is, this is on top of a mountain in the Big Island. It's measured all the time. You see the seasonal oscillations back and forth as the air gets cooler, warmer, those type of things and absorption changes. But you see it going up at basically about the same rate. I think the two might be really connected. And then let's look at, OK, well, what, what's happened? And as we melt the ice that's on the land and warm the oceans a little bit, as atmosphere warmed, what happens with sea level rise? the things that we care about in coastal areas, as well as the impacts all over the planet. So you can see there another one, another indicator that about, you know, along that same time period, seeing pretty big increases. So what does that mean? It's a cup, it's about one, you know, it's really about an inch per decade, a couple inches per every 20 years, but we see that accelerating as well. But what does that mean? If it accelerates, like a lot of us people think, you know, but we don't have a lot of certainty around that, could we see a change of up to a meter from where we are now to the end of the century. And so that would be catastrophic for many coastal areas. And we'll still have to talk about that. I'm not getting into the details of the climate change and what, because really what to me, to me is more important for a lot of us is understanding some of the things and how that impacts us and what we can do about it again. So first thing I do want to say, though, it's really, really complicated. We have great scientists like Greg that you heard from, you know, millions of scientists really around the world who are trying to better understand, who do understand and measure all the gozentas and gazaltas, as I say, of heat energy that comes into our planet. You know, from solar radiation and then it's reflected, if there's greenhouse gases, it traps it a little bit, our earth itself radiates heat, all these things happen. And that's how we really try to understand and even predict what's going to change in the future really really complex a lot of factors can go into that happy to take questions about that at the intermission here as mentioned i'm going to stop here what in about uh hmm, let's see probably in about 15 minutes or so to take a first set of questions let everybody stretch and stop looking at powerpoint on zoom uh so we'll do that go ahead and if you have questions you can type them into i think it's the down in the q a session now and uh we'll try to get to those in the break or at the end all right so then when we take a look at this, let's take a look at things we really care about, costs, and how the, whether if we see more and more the costs going up over time, costs in terms of dollars and costs of human lives, even I can have a slide on that. But look at this is just last year in 2020. These are all the billion dollar events. This came from, comes from NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. The slide and all these facts were put together under the last administration. You can see basically what was happening last year. We know the predominant cause in this country of high cost events are hurricanes. Not that you folks care about those. Not that me, as you know, I like to say, you know, I was born just a couple of years before Hurricane Betsy back in, uh, you know, early 60s, I think it was sometime, you know, and that wasn't the name of my sister. So I blame her for all this. But, uh, you know, it's a. Uh, these are the, these events, the fires, the floods, the droughts, costs, and you know, really just, and we track this, we understand it. And if we see the continued increase in these, we know that, you know, we need to understand and plan for that as well. Another way to look at costs is, well, where do these things happen? I talked about hurricanes, right? Well, what do Texas and Florida have in common, other than neither one of them can apparently be at the University of Alabama in football? Uh, that basically, these are the, the highest cost areas 
of, you know, the most severe ones in terms of millions of dollars. And look at this billions of dollars for those hard red states over time. This is back in the, over the last 40 years. So you can see coastal areas, but especially Gulf Coast, Florida and Texas bear the brunt of the cost of this. So this is why changes in climate that are driving this up very important. I also look at this, and this is another stat, again, from the same type of reporting, the National Climate Assessment put out a couple of years ago, cost per year of what it takes. And you can see over the periods, and I'm going to draw this a little bit, but you can see the periods throughout here, these five-year intervals. Look what's happening going all the way down here, how the costs are increasing. Look at the lives lost, also increasing over time. Now, you'll also notice the last year and the last three years, actually things were a little bit down from that trend. Likely a momentary thing. Is this a long-term trend? Again, a lot of uncertainty. We don't really know, but what we do know is over the last 20, last, you know, 40 years, things have been changing in a negative way in terms of lives lost and costs. Population has been growing, coastal infrastructure growing. So how much is climate? How much is a part of human behavior? Still need to figure those things out, but it's not a good trend. All right, so cost certainly important here. Um, we also look at, okay, what's gonna happen going forward? Droughts have been hugely impactful recently, especially in terms of fires, in terms of water shortages, in terms of a lot of things that impact humanity. And we can see the, even that they, we put out every season what it looks like. The droughts that have been out west are going to continue. Uh, some new ones are going to develop even around the San Francisco and Monterey Bay area, it looks like, and even in the Florida Peninsula. Again, a seasonal forecast, but things to be aware of. Droughts can be just as damaging, not in terms of cost largely, but in terms of infrastructure and in terms of economy, hugely important. All right, so that's some of the climate facts that I, I talk about. Now, where are the few of the ocean things, and how do you know these well? Yes, the ocean is warming, the sea level is rising, we're seeing species becoming extinct. We're seeing invasive species come in like lionfish and take over, possibly to the degradation of snapper and grouper and those type of things. The oxygen levels go down, acidification. We see harmful algal blooms with a lot of uh, toxins and pollutants coming into the water from fertilizers, some natural causes as well. We even see changes to the currents all over the world likely due to climate change because we see this you know we can trace this back to changes in various patterns and things like that so our ocean health and prosperity as we all know looking at the dying off of coral reefs where we've really already lost close to half of them around the globe and it looks like by the mid of the century we could well have over 80 percent of the coral reefs be dead and bleached around the, our, around you know all over our all over what's happening on our planet great institutions in florida doing research to try to counter that, reverse that trend, but it's really hard. A lot of that is due to warming, most of it, ocean warming. Okay, what does that mean? You folks understand. Nobody wants to go to the beach in the middle of a harmful algal bloom. If you've ever walked out there, it stinks, fish are dying, nobody wants to be on a beach when that's happening. Also, some toxins get involved. How does the nobody know that? So that, that really provides impetus to a drop in the economy. The ocean economy, the ocean also provides about half the oxygen with all the plankton out there turning carbon dioxide into oxygen. We start to basically have any kind of negative impact on plankton, we can see that change. Maritime transport, US trade and international trade. Recreation, again, why does Florida not have a state income tax, which is why I'm moving back eventually. <laughs> uh, is it, you know, it's because of the great tourism, the bed and hotel tax, as we used to say. Uh, so those, these type of things, our economy and ocean health are closely linked. And it's across our nation as the world's leading maritime nation, in my opinion. All right, so now let's take about all of those things. That's great. So what about this national security stuff, John? You're at Admiral. How did you get involved in this? Think of it both in terms of readiness. Our readiness to do the military's mission. You know, we look at basically Hurricane Michael in 2019 over there on the top left corner there. As you can see, everybody remembers of the dramatic impact of that. Uh, you know, this was, you know, tremendous loss uh, of military infrastructure. So therefore, those planes, those people, that infrastructure are not ready to do its job. 
storms where our carrier piers are, if they can't get underway or they can't get any supplies on board, you know, then maybe it was supposed to deploy. Maybe it has to wait a couple of weeks because of eruptions and logistics to get them the things they need, food, all that type of stuff. Then our military has to be ready to respond to so many things, more catastrophes happening all over the world. And if they have to be ready for that, are they ready to go and do combat operations? Can they even get to where they need to be to deploy sometimes? Flooding in Norfolk, Virginia, the largest Navy base in the world, where our carrier piers are. There are huge implications. If you're not ready to do your job, if there's a delay in anything, it has cascading impacts of the soldiers, the seamen, the airmen, the Marines being able to get to where they need to do to do their job, not to mention training, not to mention all the civilians and contractors who support all this. Readiness is a team effort, especially in this nation. Interruptions in that due to climate change, or we've measured them, they're happening, and we have to understand it does have impacts and costs. Admiral. Uh, so. Uh, well, next, I think your slides are, now they're advancing. Yeah. Thanks. The next one is, oh, sorry. Let's go there. My bad. Thank you, Jennifer. There was a blurb there. Okay, let, let's go back. These are the horrible things that are happening to readiness. Back up. This is it. Hurricane Michael. I got had a couple of screens going there. Carrier pairs in Norfolk, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardmen, all that, soldiers having to respond to things, and then getting to work, getting to the ships, getting to places to do your job. All these things are impacted. Sorry about the slide advancement there. Thank you, Jennifer, for smacking me upside the head like you know a good moderator should. I did right, it. Now let's try this. Okay. Now, in terms of effectiveness, can you do your job? Think of this, you're a Navy SEAL who's used to being able to go across certain beaches in the world with certain types of waves and currents, and all of a sudden it's changing. It's not like it used to be. Submarines that used to be able to plan on certain conditions under the water, in the ice, wherever, all of a sudden those are changing. Aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf, think where it's 120 degrees. Well, what if it's 130? How does that impact those people on that flight deck who have to be outlined at? What's there? Can they train? All these things. And then think about the soldiers in the desert over there, similar conditions. And they're having to take a look at things like all decked out and this type of things. Oops, how does that impact them? These poor folks. I mean, I've been over there. And you talk with these folks. I tell you what, they're in great shape. But you'd be amazed the amount of water they drink. This is something you probably don't care about, but just so you know, when you go in the bathroom and you have to go and urinate, there's a chart on the wall, and based on the color of your urine, you have to drink X amount of water within the next 30 minutes. That's a medical requirement for soldiers and sailors and whatever in the Gulf. Anyway, those type of things. Okay, so we have readiness, we have effectiveness, and it's impacts of warming, impacts of climate change. You can dive into any of those issues during the Q&A. Now think about what's happening around the world with climate change. Think of food security, overfishing, as we see here with these type of things going on. We see dramatic overfishing in areas. We see fish and things being caught you would never want to eat because of toxins. You know, sewage and fishing happening right together. We see droughts, which, are, you know, the analysis says that's what led to the unrest in Syria that we see today. Rice farms being inundated with sea level intrusion. Saltwater intrusion kills the rice field. So then we have, you know, we got, a, we basically were able to solve a lot of the food crises in Bangladesh back when the beetles were over there and things in the 1970s because of rice and those type of crops. Those are now disappearing and we're having, seeing a lot of food crises again. All right, let's take a look at food security just in fisheries. So this is from uh, last year report came out at the very end of the year, an international report that looks at fisheries. You care a lot about fisheries. We care a lot about fisheries in Florida, I should say. So look at this here and we can see, okay, how much of the fisheries is being caught and captured, hook, net, whatever, and it's been uh, steady. So we see growth in aquaculture, which can help, you know, basically help to meet the demands of the growing population. 15% of whom rely totally on the ocean for food and protein. So as we see that, well, okay, that's great. So it looks like maybe we're having a, you know, a positive trend. But unfortunately, another thing that's happened is, what do we see in terms of sustainability? The bottom line is that even though we aren't catching anymore, the amount that we have been catching is not sustainable. We see unsustainable fisheries increasing all the time around the world. 
we see barely sustainable fisheries becoming, you know, less and less sustainable all the time. So the underfished populations are just about gone. And this was in 2017 when they did a global analysis reported in 2020. So just think about that. Greater populations, the current trends keep going. Where is that going to take us? And then getting back to if I can't catch fish here, where am I going to catch it? I'm going to catch it somewhere else. Water security. Wars for waters. We've seen these happening some degree already in some of the African nations. You know, if I don't have water, I'm going to find it somewhere. Basic needs, food, water, you know, these type of things, heat, energy, security. These are the basic needs that can lead to conflicts. We're seeing this happening. A lot of people have written about this being greater in, in the future. All right, looking a little bit at the impact of climate change on competition, as we call it, with our peer competitors around the globe. All right, we tell you now, here's Florida losing to Oral Roberts recently, unfortunately. The type of competition I'm talking about this competition, again, with nations like China and Russia, part of our national security strategy, the last one, and hopefully the new one, is going to look at these threats from those nations and others. China has a great maritime strategy. We're going to take over half the world, trade routes, fisheries, everything else, and we're going to do it sustainably. They have no record of doing anything sustainably, so how do we make sure, or how do we come out against that? Is this a national security concern, a global security concern? You betcha. What is China doing to prove how sustainable they were? They're taking coral reefs and turning them into islands with these giant ships like this. I mean, you know, taking that and then dump a bunch of sand and dredge and turning it in. And now they're saying, I, I own that on, it's mine. I'm gonna put a military, uh, you know, I'm gonna put a some type of landing strip, sorry, some type of air base landing strip there. And hey, now it's my island. It's not international water space anymore. The UN has come out and said, no, it's not yours. China says, well, I don't care. So what do you do? Again, expanding their reach, expanding their negative influence on the ocean and the planet. National security concerns, especially on top of climate change concerns. China and other nations fishing outside of their waters illegally, unreported, unregulated, with pirate fishing. You can read all about it. Just go in and Google it. Tremendous detrimental impact on those fisheries that I talk about, in addition to transnational criminal activities combined with narcotics, combined with human trafficking and those type of things. Competition in the Arctic. This is a Navy prediction that I worked on when I was in the Pentagon that shows routes, sea routes opening up. We're seeing it already. More and more transport through the Arctic. Russia owns 40% of the coastline in the Arctic. You know, is Russia going to some point and say, hey, if you want to come anywhere north of here, not just in my waters or along my coast, you're going to have to pay a tariff. Because guess what? I've decided this is all my water over here. You think Russia would do that? You think the U.S. is ready to stop that with its islands? I don't know. It's a national security concern we ought to be thinking about. Mining the deep water for these minerals that we need for our cell phones, x-rays, and microwaves. Are people going to do that sustainably in international waters? possible conflicts there. We've never done a good job of mining sustainably in the history of humankind. Hard to believe we would do that at the bottom of the ocean as well. And international, so both national security, homeland security, as we look at the readiness of our bases, Tyndall Air Force Base again and things like that after Hurricane Michael, uh, looking at, you know, you guys went down to, to areas of Key West, flooding sapping more and more, same in Miami. Huge storm waves, this is in China a few years ago, islands that are disappearing, people's homelands and the instability, including ours, that that basically drives toward conflict possibilities and issues of national security for the US. All right, and don't forget codependent infrastructure. How do you get to work on a base? How do you move your logistics from one base to another and fly out of there? This is what happened a couple of weeks ago, just south of Monterey, California. Those of you who have driven along Highway 1, the most beautiful drive in the world, I think. I've been there many times. You can't drive there for several months. What if we had to move? Because back during the start of Devon Storm, we moved stuff on bases down this and other highways right up the coast to fly them out of then what was Fort Ord. How do you do that when the infrastructure starts to fall apart? So with that, I'll tell you one thing we know for sure is things change over time, okay? This is me from, I don't know, 27, or sorry, no, back in about uh, 1977 to about 2007, 2017. So not quite 50 years, 40 years later. So anyway, when you're looking at that, 
uh, you know, say, well, that guy went downhill. Look at the coral reefs happen in the same time. I may have gone downhill, but this is off the coast of Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale area. This is a beautiful reef I got qualified to dive on in 1975, right over here. This is what that reef looks like now. So I may have gone downhill, but I'll tell you what, our coral reefs are much worse off. So that shows you how things are changing. This is not just natural. These coral reefs have been around for thousands of years, but to think that a coral reef is gonna be basically is dying faster than a human, it's really, really, you know, it, it is a challenge. So that's where we are in terms of challenges. And I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second and see, let's see, you know, we can take what, I don't know, five or 10 for some questions now. If you've got any, Jennifer, and then, you know. Absolutely. Go on. No. Admiral, that was a, a terrific overview of, of things changing. I love the, uh, what was that middle school picture? <laughs> Yeah, actually, it was high school. I was always really young looking, even now. I know I still look like I'm probably college age. So, you know. There you go. So um, we do have some some great questions, and um, and actually looking at the belts and road issue and shipping lanes, there was a great question that came in from Greg. He just said he's in Florida somewhere. He wants to know about supply chain and how can manufacturers and steamship lines reduce their environmental impact. And he also notes that right now because of COVID and reduced um, workers at docks, et cetera, that there are ships that are stacking up and not even able to deliver supplies. And so that's harming the environment as well. So I know these are considerations the Navy looks at and our merchant marine and our shipping. So love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a big question. I'm trying to get, try, try to keep it short. And, my, and you know, the most recent example, of course, I think as of the last couple of days, we've had a huge, uh, a freighter, uh, a humongous container ship sideways in the Suez Canal aground, and you can't have traffic going through there, which then interrupts the entire supply chain that Greg is talking about, and then packs up. You know, you're expecting to get your Amazon package from something that's made overseas, and now it's days later, and you're wondering where it is. Of course, you get the little messages and all that. So anyway, uh, but yeah, so this is basically, the maritime transport is humongous and it's growing all the time, anticipated to double by 2050 in terms of maritime commerce. They keep bailing bigger ships with more stuff on them, taking more risk, more and more containers stocked on top of each other, shorter routes, faster, more hazardous weather. All these things are happening. And Greg is right. We're building more. And we're again, all of the ships or 99 percent of them, you know, operate on oil and gas. And you know, they're gonna for decades. What we can do is to use more efficient engines. We're seeing those come online. We can start to use scrubbers, you know, a catalytic converter type of assembly on those systems. And we can also start to look at making sure that we're really developing a future of maritime transport that is starting to look at electric motors and these type of things, which are much more efficient. Also, natural gas works great and it's much cleaner. So maybe uh, an interim bridge of natural gas as new ships actually come online. But these are great opportunities for the mines to look at these solutions, build you know, maritime transport is a great opportunity to build more environmentally sound things. But Greg is right, this is one of the challenges. The good news is if we can get rid of some of the other causes of electrical power, of the vehicles we drive, it's going to take again decades, but we can do some of the other reductions in a much more, you know, in a much faster time span. So yeah, it's a huge challenge. And yes, the, the Navy is concerned. A lot of international folks are very concerned about all these issues, huge environmental impacts that go way beyond climate change as well. And yeah, and I'll give my email at the end. Anybody wants to talk to me about this more, have a conversation with the group, happy to do that. But that's a topic unto itself. Absolutely. And um, in the chat, I put your biography on the Ocean's Leadership website, and there's an email on that as well. I know. Yeah, so. that's my current one. Uh, you know, I'm going to be retiring in a few months here after doing this for five years. So I promise I'd only work in a full time CEO kind of job for five years because I want to get out and do more of this type of work, talk to more people, work more in the field, help educate, whether it's kindergartners or it's people that are my age around what faces this and let's find solutions. Terrific. So I think we have time for one more question before you get back to your slide. Okay. And this is a good one. Um, I think it's from Charlie. Uh, he wants to know, how can we, uh, what are your ideas on how to depoliticize this issue? 
issue of climate change? <laughs> Uh, well, the, the the first way, and I saw another question on, on the Navy, a chat thing did pop up. I'm going to get into that uh, right now, <laughs> but uh, happy to take that on later. I'll just say you depoliticize it. We, we have seen that happening, but we need to really, this is up to us. This is up to us as voters and constituents. And understanding the importance of these issues is paramount. And it's having honest conversations and I'll, you know it's just it breaks my heart sometimes to have an off the record conversation with a senator or a congressperson somebody in the white house who says yeah we know these are problems but you don't understand if we start talking about like that we're not going to get elected and you're going to get somebody who's even worse or something like that so you know but we you know we're seeing it happen more and more you even saw uh with governor desantis a year or so ago stood up a climate change office in you know, they're in Tallahassee with the climate change environmental leader, a wonderful woman who's been very active. People are coming around, they're seeing the impacts because of the cost, if nothing else, and the risk that I, I talked about. Again, we can talk about causes and doing all these kind of things, but at least if we start to take it seriously and look for solutions, and like we're doing with the pandemic, listen to the science. I'll come back to that. So thanks. But yeah, it's got to come from us, and it's got to be a voice, a strong voice, and it's going to be honest and open types of, of conversations. And you also got to listen, 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 listen. Too many people, and the, you know, with voices like mine, especially scientists, they just want to talk. Of course, here I am talking, but I can't see you, so it's hard to listen. You've got to listen and be willing to understand other people's points of view. Where's the middle ground? Can we get to some things that are make sense so about fisheries, coastal erosion, whatever, regardless of you know, how fast climate change is happening, what the causes and this and that, can we take some logical steps? Again, going back to looking for solution, positive change that we can do, but actually agree on. So Admiral, one more question came up. I know you want to get back to your presentation, but this is also a great one, um, is uh, how, how much is the US Navy collaborating with other navies for other countries around the world? Because obviously, everybody's dealing with the sea level rise and climate change. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a tough one. Uh, we have been, you know, a lot of how much international types of, of collaboration our Navy does sometimes depends on the leadership of the administration. The Navy follows what the White House and the administration does. Uh, I'll be honest, last administration, a lot of the international type of work was cut short, especially in areas like this, science and everything else. The military, the Navy was still doing its work here. And some of our closest allies, you know, with Canada, the UK uh, and Japan still ongoing. But before that, and I saw this a lot during my final years in the Navy, the US was leading efforts. Italy looking at, you know, Italy has a huge fuel and logistics base that we in the United States Navy rely on. Guess where? In Venice, or in, in that area. We, we go across the Mediterranean. That's where we get food and all these type of things. That place is a mess. You've seen it, you know, it's flooding more and more all the time. It's sinking like Norfolk, Virginia on top of sea level rise. We collaborate a lot. We've led. The Navy's not been leading a lot in recent years, but we've got to get back to that. And uniform people can help influence the political divide we talked about as well. So we collaborate. We need more, more vocal. We need more of the senior admirals not trying to hide around the corner when they're making statements as well. Uh, admirals, generals, and whatnot. Yes, but yes, we, we collaborate a lot, but it's got to be more than we are right now or have been in recent years. All right, back to you then. Uh, we'll answer right. questions at the end, but back to your All question. Right. So let's see how many people that I upset by getting overly political. Come back to that at the end, right? Okay. All right, sharing again. You can give me a thumbs up if it's on the screen again, and we'll get past this Q&A. We're back here, but now instead of talking about that red stuff and the challenges on the left, we're going to talk a little bit more about what are some of the opportunities. I'll try to anyway. Okay. All right. Well, guess what? Some futures are certain, they're more certain than others. We know where I'm going to end up, right? But we have a chance to make some differences. We can make change. You can't change change on where I'm going to go, although I'd like to think I could do this. You know, maybe we can do that with some of the biometric stuff, right? Maybe I'll, I'll look like Mr. Pitt here in another five or 10 years, doubtful. But what can we do for positive change? We can make differences with respect to the environment and climate change. We got to think hard, and a lot of it's good. It's common sense. All right, so we'll start with that and go forward instead of backwards. 
institutions, and this is ocean science, but the same thing applies to many areas of atmospheric science. These are the things that I have my hands and feet that are deep into, as do a lot of the universities and institutions in Florida, even high schools, middle schools even. Looking at technology and science to change the way that our ocean is going in terms of health. I've talked about fisheries, warming, climate change, all this. Think about this, environmental DNA, that's what that thing is, being able to take a glass of water and determine what fish have been there in the last couple of days. How does that change over time? Looking at sound, all these kind of things. Think artificial intelligence, robotics, all this stuff. We have so much more information, just like we do about everything now, over to where we had 20 years ago. Think 30 years ago, basically when I was in the Navy, we didn't have email, we didn't have internet. Everything was done much in a much different manner. Going forward, how is it going to be in 30 years? We need to take advantage of the developments in science and t technology to have a different future than the things I talked about. And there are great opportunities. Smart investments are key in focusing on the science and technology at every level of our nation and influencing others is key. Let's talk about infrastructure, okay? So where's the U.S. in terms of globally, in terms of the readiness of our infrastructure, according to the World Economic Forum? We're down here at 13th, and this is again looking at 2019 type of things. This is where the U.S. infrastructure is. Now, so some of these nations, okay, great, smaller, these kind of things, but my gosh, you know, I'm a little bit ashamed. I don't want to be ranked 13th if I'm the University of Florida. If I'm in the U.S., I sure as heck don't want to be 13th down there. So what has been happening? What's the trend here? If you go and look at this, this is, I took this from the NPR, you know, they have the news hour every night. This is what flashed up on the screen. It talks about that same fact I just said. This is what happened since the year of 2002. Again, a, a, a picture from my cell phone. In terms of our infra, the quality of our infrastructure, we've gone from being, you know, on the, uh, on the bubble of being, uh, <clears throat> and we were fifth place of almost getting into the college football championships back in 2002. Now we're not even close. We got to change that trend. I appreciate this administration focusing on infrastructure. It's hugely important, but it's got to be more than the White House. It's got to be state houses, local, everybody else. We've all got to think about that. And guess what? With infrastructure recapitalization come jobs. Another thing we can do, and that's a great opportunity, is again, listening more to the science. Go from the data and analysis and investing into this stuff at the bottom. These are the expensive things, okay? Because we have to put data observations in the ocean. Communicating, communication is critically important in terms of impact to get the people who make the decisions to make the right ones. Think about how this worked out with the pandemic. In record time, we went from data and analysis of vaccines to now trying to communicate and make sure people understand the impact of getting it to making the right decision to get vaccinated so we can go back to a productive, normal society, right? Same thing with climate change and the associated factors. All right, let's look at some examples. Again, Temple Air Force Base. I was born in Panama City. My father was a civil servant after being in the Army Air Corps in World War II and worked at Tyndall Air Force Base. I've seen many hurricanes when I was young down there. This is what happened after Michael at Tyndall Air Force Base. Okay, and along came all these news outputs. Massive funding influx expedites. $4 billion to rebuild Tyndall Air Force Base. Maybe that's the right decision, but is it? Would it have been smarter to build Tyndall somewhere else? I don't know. I have a lot of doubts. And this is somebody who's from that area. Maybe, you know, like, you know, when Homestead Air Force Base got damaged, they decided not to build it back. Strategic reasons, whatever. But it wasn't where they put the planes elsewhere. Maybe could have, Tyndall could have been the same thing. Politics got involved. Five years prior to that, the DOD funded looking at sea level rise coastal scenarios. And the Gulf Coast bases were identified as, you know, in addition to Norfolk, in addition to, to Key West, that are the most vulnerable ones. So if they're that vulnerable for sea level rise, why are we building back on wet sand? There's a really old book that talks about building houses on wet sand. Some of you might be familiar with. Um, a lot of religious folks look at that book. Uh, anyway, I do as a diehard Methodist. Even a great report over here, look at the great people who were authors of this. Oh, one of them's me, of course. Uh, just kidding, of course. But anyway, we did the same thing looked at sea level rise military installations and what should a military do? And if they're gonna keep going in bases like, if you see down there, that little thing right there says NAS Key West. If you've ever been down to Boca Chica, just north of the Key West or just east of it, whatever. Uh, yeah, that place, you know, it's gonna be gone if we get another foot of sea level rise, I'm convinced. So how do we think now about the right decisions 
which can also be jobs for people, but not keep patching the potholes. When are we going to rebuild the roads? Now, some things that are happening and great opportunities. Some friends of mine, not close friends, stood up a company a few years ago called Jupiter Intelligence, said, we're going to get the best scientists in the country. We're going to create a for-profit company that's going to contract out to tell you how to come up with a plan to deal with climate change, especially sea level rise, but other things as well. So contracts are being let by all parts of the federal government and others, cities and towns, because these are genius folks. And they're starting, you know, they're, they're making a profit. And this is what was announced just recently. The Air Force is going to let Jupiter Intelligence study Wake Island. Should we have a base there? How do we reinforce it? Those type of things. So think about entrepreneurial opportunities associated with combating climate change impacts. Genius idea. Sorry I didn't come up with it. All right, where are you investing your money these days in terms of energy? We know fossil fuels, again, we're producing the greenhouse gases, leading to things that I've talked about. You're going to dive down that at some point if anybody wants to, but probably don't have time for it. But happy to talk to you offline. Look at where we're going, coal futures. You want to invest in coal right now? Hmm, that trend right there doesn't look very productive to me. Okay, yeah, natural gas, as I talked about, still a little bit on the rise. Oil, price of oil has been eh, pretty good. I enjoy filling up my tank these days as opposed to several years ago. Anyway, it's probably going to stay flat and start to actually come down. But looky here, nuclear, renewables. And by the way, I'm a big fan of nuclear power. Happy to talk about that. The Navy does it safely on submarines and carriers for many years. I think we can do it safely. This nation should be leading the world in that. Where are you going to invest in? We are, what are the opportunities there? Investment drives the production as well. If you're willing to invest and buy the right cars with electric cars and things like that, look at how many car companies have said all, all electric by 2025, 2030. This is where the trends are going. These are great opportunities to have a better infrastructure. It's going to take longer in the maritime field, but many others don't. Wind energy. Look at the investments that are going on in wind energy. Uh, hard on the Gulf Coast because there's not enough wind you can count on. <laughs> But other parts, the East Coast, not quite as far south as Florida, building out, starting to build out big on the ocean, offshore wind. Again, $14.5 million from the Energy Department and federal partners. Research looking at offshore wind, even off the coast of California with floating wind turbines because it's too deep to build the structures. Great opportunities there as we look at other sources of energy. Food security, aquaculture. Some people, environmentalists say, oh, it's too dangerous. We're going to poison the environment, invasive species. So we can sit around and do nothing and watch all the fisheries die off. This nation should be leading the world. We should have, we have the best managed fisheries in the world. We could have the best managed offshore fin fish aquaculture. And we can go more tight toward these things of integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. The seaweed that you eat and many things today. Clams, mollusks. Think of a whole system, a giant aquarium that's growing sustainably food. And not just here, but all over the world. Great opportunities to do that. The federal government's getting in the way of some of these things. We got to fix that. We tried hard with the last administration. This administration is also really committed so far to looking at growing aquaculture efforts in this country. Because we know how to do it. We can make sure others are doing it so that the shrimp you're getting from where the hell ever it came from in Costco is grown sustainably. And we can verify that. All right, tourism. Think of this. So this is... Recently released uh, over there in the Persian Gulf of the rich nation of Qatar, all that oil money. This is an eco-friendly hotel. So it's going to be open in 2025, supposedly. The currents, the tidal currents in and out, spin this hotel in a circle once every 24 hours. Huge turbine that creates electricity. Other things going on as well. This is going to be designed to be energy independent. Think of energy independence in terms of tourism eco-friendly tourism. People want to do this. Young people so much, you know, would love to stay here. Rich people want to park their yachts there. Though. Think of an underwater expression so you can have a suite where you can watch the coral reefs, these type of things. Great opportunities of looking to advance eco-friendly type of things like this. So now I'm going to lead you to this point here of, okay, well, John, great stuff, but how, you know, this is such a huge job. We're talking billions, trillions of dollars in investment. You know, so how do we do this? So first of all, I always ask the question, so do we need ships? And the answer is absolutely. And But John, what the heck do ships have to do with this problem? <clears throat> because I want a strong Navy. We need ships. We need the right ships. They need to be environmental friendly, green fleets, whatever you want to call it. I don't care, but we're doing that too. The Navy's invested a lot in this, and they are doing that. Some of the most uh, energy efficient ships on the planet are in the U.S. Navy. 
But the ships I'm talking about, well, or is it these ships? Do we need more research in the ocean? You betcha we do. And these ships and a lot of these research ships support universities in Florida so we can better understand those things. But yeah, we need ships. But you know, the ships I'm talking about are these ships. These are the ships that, you know, a Navy guy is saying, I need more than all the floating ones. And it starts at the top with leadership. All these ships, we own the problem. We've got to invest with sponsors to fix the problem. We've got to educate, educate, educate. And we've got to be great stewards. So you understand that. All right, well, I'm going to start just a little bit and talk a little bit about partnerships. All right, think of the four main sectors that have money, basically, or have funds, get funds from others, whatever, but investing in these problems, it's governments. Again, various levels, from the local to the White House and Congress. It's academia, it's industry, it's philanthropy, big investments in trying to solve environmental problems, trying to build back infrastructure, all these type of things. Figuring out ways to do a better job of partnering. This is partnerships and what organizations like ours, like yours, Anna, like yours, Jennifer, you're all about partnerships. Bring the right people together around the table. My God, let's work together, right? That's what this is about, partnerships. And you get, you know, there's an exponential return on investment if you can partner and work together. We've seen it happen. Just that's why we have allies in the military. One priority I talk about is ocean observing. Now, this is so important to the coastal floor as well. What's happening with harmful algal blooms, for example? And my bias, we are, you know, atmosphere, it's easy. We have satellites. We have everybody taking weather observations on their back porch. If you get certified, you can plug it into weather underground. All that data goes into this giant network. Ocean observations, it's harder. It's more expensive. But my take is if it's wet in the ocean, it ought to be bringing back all kinds of data. And we're not investing smartly there right now. So we have great international organizations, great national ones stood up, big conferences. But again, from a surfboard, the things we drop off the ships to those big container ships that are screwing up the environment, they ought to be taken. And it's more than just the temperature of the water coming in and out of the ship. We can do a lot more for pretty cheap. Some ship, Maersk has said it's going to be all of its, you know, within the next five years, even it's going to, all of its ships are going to be taking, you know, observing many of the main, the essential ocean variables. They volunteer to do that. Others can get in line as well. Ocean observing can help us to understand how to, how to solve these problems, better understanding climate change and that stuff and all those factors as well. All those, they really reduce the uncertainty of when we have to make decisions. All right, partnerships can help do that. Again, you saw partnerships there. Again, governments, allies, international, right? Ocean observing to better understand it. Just one example. What about the leadership piece? All right, so what about leadership? Leadership is crucially important here. The U.S. needs to be leading but we need to be leading at every level. Uh, one way we're leading is getting back again to that science-based decision-making. Again, being an example, listening to, and it's not just science-based in terms of listening to the scientists, more scientists that are in governmental levels. We have many more lawyers than we do scientists at various levels of government. Maybe because they're, they're a lot, that they speak a lot better, they're more influential, whatever. We need more scientific baseballs. Not saying lawyers are bad. I did not say that for the record. Uh, so anyway, but we need more, we need a more diverse set of leadership in this nation, I'm convinced, again, at all levels. Uh, and that gets to all these houses again. You know, these houses, there's the White House, there's our Capitol. There's a, hey, we're in this Supreme Court building, legislating, making sure the right legislative things are taking impact, being followed. Oh, and here's the uh, Florida State House. A lot, you know, for years, it was that beautiful little building there, and they built this monstrosity because they created, had to increase the level of bureaucracy. Okay, I did say that. But anyway, I'd much rather have people working elsewhere, you know, but uh, instead of having to build that type of infrastructure, focus on infrastructure money on other things. But a lot of you probably don't agree with that, and that's fine. Uh, anyway, but yes, we need people in these areas who are listening to science and who are scientists and technologists who can help make decisions around these problems. So that's a leadership opportunity that we have. And again, you know, then you're influencing leaders. You in this virtual room are influencing leaders, are leaders, have been leaders, whatever. And you can help to drive this home. And again, I, I see this happening more and more all the time. More leadership is taking advantage of this but we've got to lead it. And if we're going to fix infrastructure, we've got to make the right decisions to make sure we're fixing infrastructure that impacts a better environment for the future. 
And I think I say we're making progress. We've gotten out of the crib and we're working together and leading and partnering about at, I don't know, the little league soccer level. Sort of like little kid soccer practice. You know, still each agency in the federal level has its own plan, its own investments, its own soccer ball, right? Very quickly, if we're gonna take advantage of the opportunities, we've got to get to this level. We need World Cup, and the US should be the example of how to build a World Cup team to tackle the ocean, climate change in a positive way. It could be great for the economy, could be great for our nation, and get us back up on top of that top ranking of infrastructure in so many areas. But we need that leadership that we talked about, and we need to listen and champion. And it's great to have policies. We have policy makers, right? That's what we think of leadership in all those houses. They make policies. The other thing comes in, it's great. This is a bridge on um, the beginnings of the Rock Creek Parkway. And this was, I took this picture out of my car on the way to work when I was working at the Pentagon. There's a sign on the other side of that bridge going the other way that says, the height of this bridge thing is about 13 and a half feet. And guess what this 14 foot truck did at about four o'clock in the morning? Signs there, policy's clear, it's all over the maps, on your Google Maps, people don't always follow the policies. So this is where another key thing is investment in social sciences. Because scientists aren't the best socialists, <laughs> anti-social out of us. How do we get, make sure we're looking at how do you change behavior? How do we change behavior with seatbelts? How do we change behavior? It's a lot of, you know, with, with smoking, these type of things. Looking at that and how do we have the same type of model going forward? And that's the final message that I wanted to leave you with on that regard. And I'll just come back to this and say, okay, that's my pitch. Uh, so yeah, we're right at about, you know, this point, I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions here for some more questions. I just want to say that, you know, I'm passionate about this. Uh, again, I'm retiring so that I can do more of getting out there. I'm happy to come and basically have conversations with anyone. Again, I prefer to do it in person. I don't care if it's at a church, it's at a moose lodge, whatever it may be, and sit down and I want to listen. And if I'm not listening or if I'm showing the wrong things, as Jennifer said, then smack me upside the head and make me listen. Because we need to have more conversations as we build these partnerships. That's what I want to do as long as I'm able before I turn into that one really ugly picture on that one slide you won't talk about because Brad Pitt's probably not going to happen. So that's what I want to do. That's what I'm passionate about. And I hope with a few of the words and things I've shown you today, maybe you can help me a little bit with that effort going forward. All right. So with that, I'm going to say again, it's time for Q&A part two, and I'll get rid of the PowerPoint, and you get to look at me and Anne, me again, unfortunately. Well, thank you so much, Admiral. Um, I'm going to start off by just asking you one of those practical um, military questions and one of those science questions. So no, noticing on the chat, a lot of us who are not in the military have a, a sincere curiosity as to how is the Navy, you know, really considering other than farming this out to consulting companies, what are some of the ideas that they're really having to struggle with at our, you know, coastal bases in terms of adapting in Norfolk or in Annapolis or in, you know, Panama City? What are some of the things related to sea level rise that are really consternation at this point. So that's the practical question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me talk about that one. And the reason I showed the Air Force for that, that right now the, the Navy hasn't outsourced any of that yet. <laughs> Not that they shouldn't. Again, those are brilliant scientists, but the Navy already has great relationship with some of these great climate ocean scientists, as does the Air Force to some degree, but the Navy's been doing ocean and environmental research a lot longer than the Air Force going back to World War II mining, submarines, that kind of stuff. So I'll just say, first of all, the Navy has invested a lot. Again, I was in charge of a task force on climate change. They stood down that task force a couple of years ago, very disappointing. You sh most task force, if, unless they're standing ones, uh, should not last forever. They should be integrated in the rest of Navy operations and strategic planning and investments. Much of it has, but it's not been successful yet. Politics had a lot with standing down that last one, I'll be honest with you, in my opinion. But the Navy still, when you look at the engineers in the Navy and what we're doing with our bases, the piers in Norfolk, the, uh, the dry docks of making sure they can look at a couple of feet of sea level rise by the middle of the century. Again, Norfolk is sinking as fast as global sea level is rising. So instead of one inch per decade, it's two. And they have dry docks there, the only dry docks on the East Coast that can deal with submarines and nuclear powered aircraft carriers. 
So she, you know, that goes way up this Elizabeth River, out of Hampton Roads, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's all, all same problem with all of our military bases on the coast, largely. But they're starting to look at the infrastructure. But the key is, again, it's codependent infrastructure. People don't live on the base largely. The contractors, the civilians don't live on the base. So the Navy is doing things, they're investing, they're trying to be good at influence, but they got to up their game. It's still little kid soccer practice. So that, then that's what we need to see in the leadership of the Navy. Uh, we've seen the pressure from the White House to do that on Secretary Austin, and that's going to filter down. Then the Navy has to invest. It's investing in infrastructure, but how do we again? And at least in Norfolk, they've done a lot of work to put together a, a, an integrated plan from the insurers to the restaurants, to the Navy, to the road builders and say, how are we going to deal with this? And also looking at future things, are we really going to be driving our own cars across those bridges and through those tunnels in Norfolk in 25 years? Or if we are, are they all going to be automated? Are you going to get in your car or an Uber and just say, I want to go to the base? But your car may say, well, Anna, would you like to drive today or can I drive for you? If I drive for you, it will save you $3 this trip and you will be much safer. And you sit back there and read a magazine. That's where the future is going. You can see it coming. So are we thinking about that? Are we thinking about teleworking like we're doing now in the future in a hybrid environment? So get the futurist, sit down in an integrated environment. And I'm seeing signs of that right now. We didn't see it in the past, really never in the past to love what needs to happen. But yes, the Navy is taking this practically, but they've got to start carving out some serious investments in leadership as well as making hard decisions. Is Norfolk going to last forever or not? Is NAS either, you know, is, are the air stations such as Key West going to last forever there or not? Or do we need to move them to higher ground? Hard decisions, but it can be done. This nation can do it. So, yeah, thanks. Um, the other question that came up, there's been some talk and an article in the New York Times that recently was published about the Gulf Coast, uh, the, the Gulf Stream slowing down and how that's going to impact the Northeast seaboard and us in Florida, because some of our sea level rise projections are being are a little higher than the global ones, in yeah. part because of that phenomenon. And um, since we live with this and it keeps our climate and our waters warm for our tourists, what are your thoughts around that and what how big an impact is that? The first thing I'll tell you is we, again, a lot of uncertainty in all these areas. We're seeing some indications of things like that. And I'll go back to, we need more observations. <laughs> so get all the surface out there, taking more observations. The more things we get, more satellite observations, all that. But the key is better understanding. We are seeing some alarming signs. So a couple things happen. Ice in the Arctic is melting. Now, ice that's already sea ice itself doesn't change the level of the water. Only, you know, basically, basically it doesn't change at all. Warming and cooling a little bit. Ice is actually a little bit lighter than liquid water, which is why it floats. It's the only, it's the only actual compound we know of that does that, which is why there's life on that planet. That's another lecture altogether. But as we see this happening, that ice melts, cold water comes out of the Arctic, cold atmosphere comes out of the Arctic. We're seeing, you know, these issues of, uh, you know, uh, various types of things of weather events, the jet stream meandering. We've seen these Arctic cyclones come further south and all these kind of things. Uh, you know, so what does this really mean? It means that the imp what causes the currents to happen is changing. The water, the atmospheric winds, all this stuff is changing, especially so we see a big blob of cold water come in that blocks some of the things going on with the warm water, the Gulf Stream and things like that. We see the winds change more frequently. So yeah, it's like a traffic jam. The water can't get up there with the same temperature difference like it used to. And so we start to see it pile up. But then longer term is the impact going to be that the whole system, the Gulf Stream on the western part of the Atlantic, but the counter current on the eastern part, will they all slow down together? If that happens, then we don't see the same pileup. So, but anytime we have anything that causes the currents to slow down or pushes water toward the coast without an escape route, we're going to see sea level rise. You see it now with winds and high tides in Norfolk and Miami and everywhere else. So yes, it's something to be concerned about. And you know, there is some indication that we could see some of these whole current structures break down in the future. Water that starts out at the surface and goes deep in the Atlantic, picks up nutrients, brings that up, that feeds the plankton, whole issues, you know, issues of biodiversity, a lot of complications there. But yeah, it's something to watch and be concerned about. But I think that one's one I want to study more than, you know, just say, well, my God, I've got to build a 30-foot seawall across the entire east coast of the U.S., which we can't afford anyway. Jennifer? 
Okay, so I've got um, I've got a good one here. Um, of course, I'm sure that you know whenever you talk about nuclear power, eyebrows <laughs> raised. <laughs> I knew you were ready for this one. And, um, and even natural gas because we know it's methane and yep. the whole fracking process is horrible and it leaks and it's 86 times worse than carbon dioxide. So, so the question is, what technologies are available to power these huge vessels in the ocean if we can't use fossil fuels or nuclear? Is there anything? Well, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure, they, having been on several of uh, the those cargo ships and container ships, I not sure I'd want to put a nuclear reactor on those. Look at what happened in the Suez Canal. The last thing you want is a nuclear ship to actually going to ground. Uh, we we do it well in the U.S. Navy, a couple other navies, but it's very very dangerous. So I don't want to, you know. I think we do it a good job in this country, other countries, and having that on land as well. But yeah, we're never going to get that. In, in, I think we we need. And people are thinking about how do I do electrical motors that can actually run off batteries. Battery technology is immense. Look at the cars we're going to be driving. Yeah, nobody wants to stop and recharge your car for 20 minutes every 200 miles or 30 minutes every 200 miles. We're seeing battery technology. In the future, having more batteries, yes, you got to charge the batteries there at sea. Can we have solar systems, wind? An interesting thing happens when a ship goes through the water, usually it has relative wind. Wind can charge batteries. <laughs> batteries can drive motors. You can start to take advantage of technologies. It's some really good, but those things are, again, unfortunately, a ways off. And I don't, you know, but I think burning natural gas is better than fuel and oil, also better, you know, that's a, a lot less chance of oil spills and things like that. So I think that's a bridge. Uh, it's not that hard to turn the motors that we have now, just like in terms of airplanes as well, uh, from liquid to natural gas. So, and we can manufacture gases as well, you know, using things such as, you know, some of our corn and agricultural stuff like that, just like we do for some of our, our liquid fuels. So. I see all this. It's you know, it's multifaceted. It's complicated. But there were some of theirs, and there are there are great things going on as well. By the way, the Navy's been doing some research for several years now of can we take water and break the hydrogen oxygen and the oxygen atoms apart and create hydrogen gas at sea. Think of having hydrogen gas powering Navy ships at sea that's made from seawater. Is it going to happen tomorrow? No. Could it happen in a decade, eh, 20 years, maybe? Is that an answer? The research investment, our military's research, by the way, our military created GPS and internet. Those are the two things, most transformational changes in human society in our lifetime. Uh, so, you know, great opportunities to do that. But those are some of the things, but only in its investments in science and tech, and it's being willing to make some bold moves. You're seeing it, and I tell you what, industry's making the bold moves. With electric cars, we're going to stop building gas-powered cars in less than ten years. Oh my gosh! You know, I mean, what a change well, that is. Until you get and, until you get in a Tesla and realize how fast it is. Anyway, and so all the drag races out there, like I used to be back when I was, you know, that first picture. Uh, yeah, they're they're great cars. So I'm convinced that those technologies will go to sea, uh, and the Navy is investing in them as well. Well, I love your emphasis on data collection, on analysis, on that can-do American spirit, and on working with universities and research, because um, I, I'm sure that a lot of professors who are, are listening or folks associated with universities, and absolutely that is an important, uh, important partnership. Uh, and, and I'm glad you mentioned hydrogen, because hydrogen is being used as a fuel in Europe and China, and the U.S. is a little bit slower on that, um, but it absolutely can be um, you know, it can be a great solution. We've got some more tweaking to do, but, uh, yeah. but absolutely. I, I, I agree. American innovation, uh, research, um, we've got some of the best minds and if we collaborate, we can do great things. So great question. Um, and, and great answer. Uh, somebody else asked, a, um, this may be a little bit too much into the biology, but um, do you, you, you mentioned algal blooms and that's a big issue uh, in Florida. And I wonder, um, do you have any knowledge of developments for removing legacy nutrients from waterways that hmm. contribute to that red tide? <laughs> that's from Cynthia. Yeah. Thanks, and that's, that, that's a tough one. Again, a lot of research is going into that. The problem with the nutrients are is they, they dissolve. You can't filter them out. We can filter out some of the plastics and debris, and that's a whole other issue again. But filtering out the nutrients is tough, and especially the residual ones. 
Now, so what are we looking at? Well, okay, we know that chemicals react with each other. Are there things that we can safely inject into the water to get rid of those nutrients before they get to places where they're going to cause the harmful algal blooms? Uh, again, this is, gets into the issue of geoengineering a bit as well, you know, which is always dangerous. Uh, you know, get back to the issue last administration and first raised back in the 70s of dropping an, an atomic bomb in the middle of a hurricane. We'd probably disrupt it, but maybe it just goes from a hurricane to a radioactive tropical storm. Which would you rather have on the southwest Florida coast? Hurricanes ain't good, but I don't want a radio, I don't want a fallout cloud associated with a tropical storm either. So <laughs> these type of things, do we do the same thing? Do we end up causing something worse we didn't account for? Uh, but again, we've seen great science. We're making huge gains, whether it's vaccines or whatever. So the, the opportunities are there. We just got to do it. We've got to test in the laboratories and do, do, do those type of things. But yeah, the other thing, but again, doesn't matter. You can treat everything that's already in there in terms of, of the residuals and try to keep it from getting into, into the environment. There are also, by the way, there are also some environmental friendly ways. There are ways to get some of those nutrients out on the way that some of the things such as grasses, uh, types of algae that are beneficial on the way down there in the rivers and waterways are actually good. And then those go to feed more shellfish and you can even eat some of those shellfish. Environmental friendly solutions are part of the plan too. Getting back to more marshlands and water, you know, and basically those type of grass areas and things like that. So I think all this can work, you know, you know, basically bring it all and to do the research and employ it and implement it. Uh, but we've also got to stop using some of these chemicals. Uh, Lake Okeechobee being one of the great examples, you know, and believe me, you know, from a kid that was, you know, I was stationed in Florida a long time, I mowed the St. Augustine grass, you know, every day in the summer for many years, you know, and I was dumping all kinds of stuff in there. So I'm as guilty as the next one. And I, you know, I used to still use fertilizer today. I live about a quarter mile from the Potomac River that feeds into the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the nation. And, you know, so I try to be conscious, but, you know, and we're all addicted to green grass, especially down there in Florida. So figuring out safe, better ways to do that is also part of research as well. I mean, we're seeing a lot of positive trends there, as you well know. So, uh, but yeah, all those efforts have to go forward, but we have to be willing. We have to be willing to take these on board and maybe spend a little bit more money in order to keep our grass green. Thanks. Yeah, cool. um, you answered even the tough questions, and I'm, I'm very impressed, and I know our audience is, and uh, we're really grateful. And I know that Anna wants to, to do a, a closing with a few things, but in 30 seconds, um, has somebody asked about the Biden administration and the big infrastructure bill, what would your priorities be for the Navy, for, for, for uh, Sea Level Rock, for the Biden administration? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, transportation, 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 with a look toward the future, as I, I talked about. Is it rails? Is it roads? Whatever it is, our transportation infrastructure is one of the worst things that, that's happening. So we need to work together, just like Eisenhower did when he created the interstate system, the national interstate and defense roadway system. Transportation should be a key focus, in my opinion. And along our coast, it's critically important. I showed you the picture of California. That's it. So maybe that's uh, 29.9 seconds. Thanks. Anna, over to you. Okay, you'll put up the... Well... I want to once again thank um, Admiral White and all of you who are still with us um, late in the day. I hope you found today's presentations both interesting and inspiring. Um, I want to inspire you to take the next step with us then. Um, if you don't know about Growing Climate Solutions, I ask you to go to our webpage, learn more about us, and subscribe. Join us. You'll receive a newsletter with easy to read climate updates. Thank you, Admiral, for teeing it up. The next newsletter is coming out at the end of this week, and it has two articles on transportation issues. Um, so this is a great way for you to begin to test the waters on climate challenges and opportunities, become a supporter or get engaged with us. You can also follow us on social media. We have a Facebook page, Growing Climate Solutions, uh, SWFL, and on Twitter, if you tweet, We've just added an Instagram account for the younger audience. So follow us, join us, refer our information to your friends. The way we build this network, the way we change hearts and minds and behavior is by talking to it, talking about these issues with people you care about, with your friends and your family. Also, if you happen to run a business or an organization or you're a leader in some capacity in your neighborhood, consider becoming a supporter of Growing Climate Solutions as a partner. Reach out to me email me 
and um, we can talk more about what's involved with that. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in about 24 to 48 hours, you'll receive a survey um, about this presentation. I really ask that you take the five or 10 minutes to answer eight questions. By filling out that survey, I get a better sense of what you enjoyed, what you learned, and how to bring more interesting programming to you. So with that, um, I want to remind you that the very last one of our Climate Compass series is coming up April 21st at four o'clock. It will feature Professor Benjamin Keyes, and he'll be talking about the coastal real estate reckoning. Is that already happening? This issue, or this last one in the series, is being held in conjunction with Florida Climate Week, which is run by the Volo Foundation. So if you are interested in learning more about climate and committed to this, Growing Climate Solutions, along with our partner, Eco America, are really engaged with Florida Climate Week. This lecture will be part of it, as, our, as is a training that Jennifer and I will be holding on how to become a Southwest Florida Climate Ambassador, the role of social media, how you can harness that. So sign up for that if you want to take the next step and learn more. And until then, you know, sign up for us. And I thank you for joining us. Spread the word and keep learning. Thank you so much. Anna. And right, one more comment. So again, I know that you sent my email. I just want to remind people, if you want to get in touch with me, I have a, I have a you know, a separate email that you can talk to me. Just remember, my name is John White, J-O-N John. And just think of Ocean John White. That's my Gmail address, oceanjohnwhite at gmail.com. Write it down if you want. The final point is don't lose hope in America. So many horrible things are going on right now, but America has been through horrible things in the past. Keep up the faith and keep up the hope and be positive like you are here. Thank you, Anna. Thank all of you. And let's get back to what America can be do, which is leading the world to a much better future. Thanks again for having me today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great, great webinar. Thanks again.